What's going on? Alex here, and today I'm going to take a look at equity crowdfunding. Now, what is equity crowdfunding? Well, crowdfunding began with websites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, where you can give money to a new company or give money for a new product, and you would get either a thank you from the founder in return, you get some sort of memorabilia from the company, let's say a hat or a t-shirt, or you get the actual product itself. So you can, in essence, pre-purchase products and then have them delivered to you once they were designed and manufactured and so forth. Now, over time, people said, well, it's good to get a trinket from the company, but I want an actual stake in the growth of this company. I want an actual piece of it if it were to grow and mature over time and there might be, let's say, a buyout at some point in the future. I want to participate in that. I want to be one of the founders, so to speak. So how can I do that? And that was this next step. This is where equity crowdfunding came into play. Whereas through a series of regulatory changes, uh, you know, you could read about Regulation A if you'd like, uh, that allowed for commoners like you and me to invest in small private companies directly. And this was something that was only available to accredited investors until a few years ago. So is equity crowdfunding a way to get rich? Is it a way to increase your wealth over time? Is it a safe place to invest your money? Let's take a look. Now, just to be clear, this is not investment advice. So I'm not recommending that you invest or not invest in any of these companies. What I'm doing is stressing the importance of due diligence and that looking at the numbers is crucial in establishing whether an investment is right for you. So now, what are some examples of opportunities in this equity crowdfunding space? Let's take a look. So I want to start off on this site uh, called Micro Ventures. Uh, the reason I like it is because it allows you to see the financial documents for some of these companies uh, that are raising money in a lot more uh, simpler fashion than some other websites uh, uh, do in that they make you go through a series of steps. These guys make it available pretty much right on the site. So let's take a look. And as you can see, there are some active Regulation CF raises. This Regulation CF is another one uh, that you could read about that allows uh, small companies to raise money directly from non-accredited investors. And you can't click into any of these other ones that already had funding. So unfortunately, we're going to be limited to these four on offer. So let's see what we got here. Let's start with Robin Autopilot. So the deal is here that the investment fees waive. So it's, it's on the cheap. Let's see. And they're raising, I don't know how much money. They raised $31,000, 62%. What are they raising? $100,000 or something along those lines. Okay, they're raising $250,000. It's a quarter million dollars. It's called Robin Autopilot. There's a $100 minimum investment, 41 days to invest. So don't, don't delay. Uh, let's see here. So convertible debt. I'm not going to get into the convoluted nature of the actual se security that you're buying by investing in this. There's a whole series of videos that need to be done on that because it's not as straightforward as you think. It's, it's not that you're lending the money as, as debt and it's not that you're buying a direct investment as equity. It's kind of a, a mix of the two, so to speak, which we don't need to cover at length right now. But let's focus on the fact that uh, they've raised $31,000, they've got 92 investors, and let's see what they offer. Okay, so there's Clearly, uh, lawn mowing is the business here. All right. This is what your lawn care looks like. There's something you need to see. Okay. All right, this is a Roomba for your grass. And uh, let's see what's happening here. Let's zoom in a little bit on this. That's not gonna make it bigger. All right, wait a second, wait a second. Hold on a second. Let's go back there one second. Okay, so he just rotated the blade of a lawnmower. Let's make sure I'm seeing this right. This can't be what just happened. He's rotating the blade of a lawnmower with his bare hand. I don't know, this is 
kind of blowing my mind right now. This is a way to lose an arm. Um, let's keep going. Wow. All righty. Okay, so he set the, the, the grass Roomba. It's doing its thing. All right. So this is a lawn mowing service where they come to your house, they put a robot down, and the pitch is you'll never have to hear the lawnmower. So nobody likes to hear lawnmowers. I'm down with that. All right. So they got a cute little video, and they got some nice stats here. Has acquired 15,000 plus lawn care customers, including 200 plus robot customers. So not all lawn care customers are robot customers. I don't really get that. Has executed 195,000 plus jobs. Has reached 3,000 plus franchise owner inquiries and has sold his first six franchises in 2018 and has reached monthly revenue of 90,000 in 2018. So all that sounds great and all these bullet points are gonna be awesome for each one of these companies. No doubt about it. The interesting part here are the documents. Now, these companies in requesting startup capital in this way basically need to make specific filings with the SEC. In this case, it's Form C. So if we open that up, we get a little bit more information about some of these companies, which can be pretty eye-opening. Uh, let me make it so you can see this. So this is a pretty long document. There are a few pages to this guy. But what I specifically like to look for, and this is kind of what blows my mind about this whole equity uh, startup uh, microfunding, equity crowdfunding world, is that uh, the financials tell a much different story usually than the actual offering and the, the front page and the bullet points and all that. So let's go directly to the financials here. So looking at the balance sheet, now you don't have to be an accountant, we can just take a look at this very in a very basic level. Now. What this number here means, being that it's negative, is that they've lost $3.2 million since this company was founded. Uh, it doesn't tell us what the founding date was. I think it says on the website. Let's see here. Okay, founded in 2015. Uh, Robin Autopilot aims to solve problems inherent in lawn care business. All right, okay. All right, so since 2015, they've managed to lose $3.2 million dollars. Um, so let's see how the income statement looks on a very basic level. So this is kind of frightening. So sales dropped from 2.7 million in 2016 to 1.7 in 2017. That's not something we want to see. We want to see the hockey stick, meaning that it's low revenue and then it's very high revenue. Here it's the opposite effect. So uh, it's kind of scary right off the bat. And gross profit has dropped. We can see that uh, salaries and wages up significantly, general admin costs up. Uh, let's see what else we have. Okay. So net income, we lost a million bucks in 2017. It's a bit less of a loss in 2016, but still not really all that exciting. So this is a company that is continually losing money. They are looking to raise a quarter million dollars. At that rate of loss, what is quarter million dollars going to change? That's what I wonder. That's the first thing. Uh, the other thing here is that they have a screenshot here from Shark Tank. And it looks like they did not strike a deal, but they were on the show. I wonder what these millionaires and billionaires had to say about this. So Robin Hood... Let's just look this up. Auto, Robin Autopilot Shark Tank. Let's see what we got. Okay. I don't know what this website's all about, but uh, oh my God, there's so many ads. I can't even. Look at this website. Website designers, you got to stop this nonsense. This is beyond ridiculous. So we're going to use this here. Okay. Came in asking for $500,000 for 5% equity. Okay. Uh, Robert Herjavec liked the idea, but admitted he didn't see a tipping point for the company. Laurie Grainer, 
viewed it as more of a consumer play and shared her concerns about the return on investment. Ultimately, all five sharks went out and the duo, being the founders, left without a deal. I could see why uh, the sharks passed on, passed on this investment. So this is just one of the examples. I'm going to get out of this browser and use something with uh, an ad blocker on it because this is getting out of control. So that's one of the offers that uh, are being displayed on this microventure site. So, you know, it, it stresses the importance of taking a look at the financials to make sure that these companies are as good as they claim. Because looking at those bullet points up front, this company looks hot. But now, when we looked at the financials, it looks kind of scary, doesn't it? So uh, those are some things to definitely uh, keep in mind. All right, so next we move right along to C.me, global art platform that promotes and sells work for artists. All right, 22 investors, 20 days to invest. Uh, they're valuing themselves at $4 million. Uh, obviously, you know, we're going to skip all this for now. So what is this company all about? It always makes me nervous when they show you the sales in the global art market because what the hell does that have to do with your business? Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to capture any of it. But, uh, all right, so we got all these beautiful people. Let's take a look. Let's see how our net income looks. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. When zero's at the top, you know you got problems. But let's save that till after the video. Join a global creative community. All right, let's give them, give them a chance. The creation of art fosters joy, bridges social and cultural differences, and brings people together to celebrate beauty. Yet there are millions of talented artists in the world today who make incredible things that will never be seen. For these artists, the lack of connection with someone who will appreciate and pay for their work often means toiling away in jobs that are not consistent with their passion. My name is Brendan Burns, and I'm the founder of Stepstone Art Resources and the CEO of C.me. My mission in life is to help other people realize their dreams. I met the team at C.me a year ago, and since then, we have relaunched C.me in a new direction. Together, we will build a community culture that truly helps artists pursue their passion. C.me is the first building block of a vision that unites artists and photographers with collectors and art enthusiasts. Since our inception, we have worked with hundreds of thousands of artists and hundreds of thousands, thousands of, of careers. We posted dozens of exhibitions from New York City to Art Basel, Miami, to the White House, to the Louvre, visited by over 250,000 guests. Our social footprint and brand recognition is strong and growing. Today, we reach over 1 million people across email and social channels. So here's how it works. We announce a jury competition. Artists from around the world enter and submit work. We identify the best work in artists and give them broad recognition. We make the top work. Isn't the whole thing about art the fact that it's subjective and that everybody has a different opinion? They're basically making themselves the arbiters of what's good art and what, what isn't good art. I, I, whatever, let's keep watching available for purchase to collectors and enthusiasts and we produce top art work. exhibitions generating exposure and excitement and promote the entire process over digital channels and social media. As a result, CME earns money from membership fees and the sale of art. Artists make money from the sale of art and gain value from digital exposure to collectors and corporate sponsors. Collectors gain access to unique, authentic work that is a true reflection of their personal taste and get satisfaction. All right, I get it. So they're trying to create a website where you go and, and they determine what's good art and what isn't and I guess display what they like that's available for you to buy and so forth. So who are they charging for this? Now, artists are supposed to pay for this. For $250, they get a two-year membership, a t-shirt, and an Instagram post. For enthusiasts, you can pay $100 to get a 10% discount on art. So you still have to pay uh, pretty much full price. Um, $250, you get a perpetual 10% discount. Um, I guess they're not valuing the art that high, right? Because if 
$250 can buy your perpetual 10% discount. I mean, if they're selling multi-million dollar pieces, they're not really, uh, that's not really congruent with that. So I don't think they're expecting too high a price on these things. I mean, you know, try to get Amazon to discount everything by 10% for $250. That ain't going to happen. All right, so let's look at the fun part, the financials. So I would think that a website like this would have put up some art, would have sold some art, would have gotten some traction and actually attracted enough attention in the art field uh, that they would be a force to be reckoned with even before they got serious money. I mean, they're asking for a million dollars, so you'd think uh, they would have some, some traction. So let's take a look. Click here, we'll go to their, let's see, they have an amended offering statement. Let's take a look at that bad boy. Form C, let's find the financials for this one. Okay, right there. Let's take a look at what we have. All right, so this is the balance sheet right here uh, for December 31st, ended 2017 and 16. Very nice. Okay, we have a retained deficit of $300,000, so they managed to lose that much since inception. I don't know when this uh, company was found. This is a Stepstone Art Resources LLC. <laughs> okay. So here's the beautiful part of this whole thing. I mean, uh, sales were zero in 2016 and $44 in 2017. This is serious traction, people. They want a million bucks of your money so they could charge artists and you as investors for the privilege of being a part of this based on $44 in revenue. I've got more money in my wallet right now. So I'm sure, you know, I don't know what they did in 2018. I'm hoping it's more traction than this, but really they've just been paying attorneys and accountants, uh, you know, receptionists. They were paying for marketing, a management fee of 65,000, a management fee of 80,000. Wow. I mean, in Brooklyn, they would say these guys got some, uh, you know, so whoever is charging 80 grand for a company that makes zero revenue and then 65 grand for a company that has 44 in sales has got some, uh, has got some cojones. Uh, this is ugly. So they lost 146,000 in 2016. They lost 116,000. Uh, there's debt on the balance sheet here. Uh, they're paying interest, 14 grand uh, in 2017, 11 grand in 2016. So, ugh. Um, anyway. That's why it's important to take a look at the financial statements, all right? Because due diligence will always tell you the truth. Well, most of the time. Um, so another one that I probably am not too excited about, but if you like the sort of thing, then uh, this might be for you. I'm curious, what does their website even have on it? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at what's up there. All right, so this looks more like a makeup kind of a skin cleanser ad, but that's fine. All right, Nigel, not Nigal, good ship. Okay, so you've got some artwork on here. So interesting, looks nice. Can I purchase it? Okay, now they have a link to the website which is not an affiliate link. It just takes you to his website. So I don't see how they're generating revenue from this. Uh, let's talk, uh, let's look at Helgi Ogri. Okay, I don't know if this is the artist or his art, but either way, there still doesn't seem to be a way to actually generate revenue for this company. Click here to introduce yourself. So, calling all artists. So they're still building this thing. And, you know, they, they're looking for a million dollars to fund it. They've just been losing money. And whoever's making 65 grand in a management fee, I mean, all the best to you, but uh, it's a little steep for a company that had $44 in revenue, I would say. But what do I know? So that's a C dot me. Again, I, you know, Use your judgment on that. Let's move over to Z House. Closing soon. They got uh, $189,000 already, so there's only six days to invest. Uh, again, bullet points are stellar. Patent pending marketplace. They're patenting stuff, so they're serious. These guys are not playing around. 
they're valuing their company at five million dollars, uh, and they, they're selling some kind of utility token. So good luck trying to figure out what that is. Uh, you know, quite simply, uh, you know, if you give them more than five grand, you get an equivalent number of Z House utility tokens and a forty percent discount on future token purchases. Discount is capped at the amount invested in this offering in U.S. dollars. Whatever. All right, let's take a look at the video. Z House, an equity sharing marketplace and reward based community designed for everyone. Traditional methods of real estate investment and home purchasing can be inefficient, unaffordable, and costly. For buyers in high demand markets, skyrocketing property prices and bidding wars means immense capital needed. These problems force many home buyers to sit on the sidelines due to significant down payment requirements and lack of affordability. Rental real estate investments often require long term commitments and can be illiquid and costly. For investors, home purchases or change of ownership involves many burdensome closing processes, including inefficient and lengthy title review, costly closing fees, and escrow and title insurance. Investing in a REIT does not offer the same tax benefits available when owning real estate, namely asset depreciation and the ability to deduct operating expenses. Yeah, I don't know about no tax benefits in the REIT, but let's leave that for another time. Imagine if there was a solution. Wait a second. Imagine no transparency. No transparency in the REIT? They need to file audited financial statements. I don't know what that's all about. Depreciation and the ability to deduct operating expenses. I don't know about that one. Imagine if there was a solution. Welcome to Z House, an equity sharing marketplace and reward based community. Is this a German company? Z House. Forget it. Designed for everyone. Aiming to make it easy to buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Fractional ownership is recorded under legal trust and on blockchain. Oh my god, there it is. Okay. So this is the big buzzword, blockchain. It seems like, and this actually happened in the stock market, that whatever you staple the term blockchain to immediately becomes an amazing investment, supposedly, right? So uh, there was... Uh, there was a company that made iced tea and they were uh, Long Island iced tea company. That was the name. And they changed it to Long Island blockchain or long blockchain. And all of a sudden their stock price skyrocketed up. I mean, it was one of the, the greatest anomalies of 2018 in terms of attaching a simple word to the name of your company. And all of a sudden it's worth millions of dollars more. It blows my mind. So this company is now shoving blockchain into real estate and so far for all of the fervor and for all of the hype on blockchain i don't think anybody's been able to implement it in any sort of interesting way i mean even kodak was getting into this blockchain thing by putting out some kind of uh, uh blockchain project seeks to raise 50 million uh they have a dubious cryptocurrency gamble they even came up with the machine that mines cryptocurrency this thing i mean cash miner it's what's going on you know people are losing their minds over this so when i see blockchain community i immediately want to throw up because it, it's such a hype machine now that i could say you know i'm looking to introduce blockchain into orange juice because that's exactly what we're missing from orange juice is blockchain so let's let's mush those together and let's see what happens I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's like, we manufacture blue jeans, but l lately we've been incorporating the benefits of blockchain. It's like, blockchain doesn't need to be in everything, okay? We got along just fine without it for so many years. I just don't get the hype in this. And then now they're, they're throwing blockchain into real estate. I mean, it's like, come on now. Whatever. House plans to bring together buyers with potential investors, real estate agents, and mortgage brokers to achieve home ownership. Existing homeowners can also use the platform to seek equity sharing opportunities. The end to end process from applying, property vetting, funding, closing. Okay, I watched more than a minute of this video. I have no idea what they're selling. But let's take a look at the financials. Let's go to Form C. Let's see what they have for us. Let's drag this over so you can see it. Good old Form C. And. Just so you know, I'm not cherry picking these these companies. They're the four that were offered there, so um, it is what it is. I, I did not just 
look for the companies that are losing money. These are the ones that are right at the top of the site. All right, so the financials are right here. All right, so the only assets are 50 grand in cash in the bank. So that's about it. Everything else is looks like uh, just money that they paid in. Um, uh, they just owe a little bit of money here, and they've lost 233000 bucks. No big deal. All right, so looking at the income statement for Z House Inc. Z House. <laughs> I like that they didn't even bother with the income line. It just doesn't even exist. I don't think I've ever seen that. I think companies usually put income, and then they put zero, or the dash, uh, but uh, I've never seen that there's not even an income line. This is just all expenses all the time. And this is for the period ended August 18, 2018. This is recent. So unlike the other ones that ended in December 31st, 2017, this actually gives us a more recent glimpse. And these guys are just burning money. It's like ridiculous. You'd think they'd put a website up, sell a house, do a blockchain, something or other. But no, it doesn't even have a, an income line. And you know, just to be clear, I'm not picking on these guys because I just like to pick on them. I mean, they're funded already. So people gave them almost 200 grand. And I don't, I don't understand what the, what the lure is. They haven't generated a single dollar to the point where they even said, hey, maybe for future reference, maybe we should drop an income line on there so they're comparable and consistent. No, they just left it right off. So this is all that they've spent money on, on no income. And there you go. Just straight up losses year to year. Uh, it's kind of disgusting. But again, it's a startup company. I know all these companies are startups. I know. I get it. I know. I love startup companies. I love that the, you can exercise the American dream in this country. But again, if you compare the Form C to all those amazing shiny bullet points right up here and their investor deck, you'll see that there's a stark difference. I mean, looking at this thing, you'll, you'll probably be amazed and, and, and just taken aback by how awesome they are. I have to turn on uh, scripts, otherwise it's not gonna run correctly, but you know, patent pending marketplace, launching blockchain-based community to pay users for advertising while offering the opportunity to control use of personal data. I have no idea what that means. Building blockchain top of Stellar network and the Hyperledger network. No clue. Maybe I'm old school, maybe I'm old fashioned behind the curve on this, but this just looks like a bunch of crap to me, I'll be honest. So, hey, could they be the next Apple? Maybe. But could they also keep losing money? A lot of maybe. Alrighty, so I think we have one more we can take a look at here. I'm trying to switch browsers up so that uh, we don't get caught up in too many ads. And uh, I also have the sniffles, if you could tell. Now, the fourth one here is Tended Bar which, uh, okay, it's kind of questionable, but uh, automated bartending machine for low to high volume services. Okay, interesting. Let's take a look. Uh, bullet points are all stellar. Design, mix and pour, to, designed to mix and pour a cocktail in as little as three seconds. Can be customized with up to 18 cocktail ingredients. Question is, if you have an automated bartender, who's gonna give you that smug look when you've been waiting for a drink with a money in your hand for five minutes and nobody's paid attention to you and finally they're kind enough to look up from the dish they've been or the cup they've been drying for the last 15 seconds and give you a little bit of a attention i think we're going to miss out on that with this whole model here but hey we got 34 days to invest we've raised eighty-eight thousand bucks so this is funded they got all they were looking for this is 355 percent of what they wanted uh now the security is offered membership interest i have no idea what that means but uh, let's take a look at the video. Tended Bar is an automated cocktail dispensing system designed to minimize lines and maximize efficiency in high volume venues such as stadiums. That doesn't look appetizing. Let's back that up a little bit. That does not look app. Ooh. They gotta, they gotta fix that pour. <laughs> they gotta adjust that stream a little bit. Again, I've never seen anybody grip a glass that way, but hey, more power to you. I'm not going to hate. Customers cocktails with the touch of a button and reduce crowd surge at concessions and service bars. 
Tended Bar's automated self-service alcohol dispensing system is designed to minimize shrink, maximize operational efficiencies, increase profits and scale through minimize shrink. technology. I don't know. Users will have an RFID wristband, verifying their age and bar tab information upon every drink purchased to facilitate responsible controlled consumption. Tended Bar plans to Oh my god, so you have to get RFID tags for every one of the bar patrons and then are they supposed to return them at the end of the night? Would you really want them to return them at the end of the night? So if not, then everybody has a new one that they need to get when they come into the bar. And then if you're going to multiple bars, you need multiple wristbands now for each one? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Because they can't come off, right? Because if they give you a wristband that can come off, you can give it to someone who's underage and they can get it back into the bar. So uh, these would need to be secure, right? So if you go to eight bars, you know, you're just bar hopping in the evening. I don't know. You might end up with a lot of jewelry. I'm just saying. Great revenue in three primary ways. One, via a revenue split for all drinks poured through Tended Bar. Two, by retaining advertising rights and working with advertisers. Three, working with advertisers. Okay. Capturing usage data and selling the data to brands and other advertising avenues. Usage data as in the drinks that people buy? All right. Okay. Whatever. We currently have a contract with Saver of Jacksonville, a division of SMG Worldwide, to place a four-screen system at the Jacksonville Veterans Memorial Arena in Jacksonville, Florida. This contract gives Tended Bar a 20% gross revenue share of every drink sold at a Tended Bar station. Tended Bar will also retain advertising, marketing, and data rights to the unit. Oh, that just doesn't look like fun. Imagine you're in a bar. I'm gonna try to make this so you can see it. Imagine you're in a bar and you got to go through this menu. I mean, I could just imagine this thing getting punched <laughs> the first week that it's in service because somebody pressed the wrong button and they get like a pina colada when they wanted a Jack and Coke. I think this thing needs to be pretty much bulletproof uh, to ensure the, uh, the, the return on investment is going to be significant. The other thing is, how much is this thing cost? Uh, because not only do they need to install it, they need to maintain it, they need to buy the refills for it someone I don't know, services it i don't know marketing and data rights to the unit tended bar has a market a contract and a venue now we need you please click below for a more in-depth overview of our business okay so i get the feeling they're what we like to call pre-revenue so let's go to good old form c let's download this bad boy and let's see what we're working with uh so far I'm not optimistic. Uh, this kind of worries me, this whole installing a huge, looks like multi-thousand dollar machine in every bar uh, that uh, is, is not going to get much love from the people. All right, so let's move this over here and take a look. I've already learned to spy the uh, financials right from the beginning right from this this view here I can find it this one's gonna prove me wrong isn't it okay here we go statement of cash flows let's go to the balance sheet okay so what we're looking at this this company with all of its crazy gadgets and machines it has 14,000 in assets 12,000 accounts payable um, okay so there's not much here. You basically have these people who invested, you know, 35 grand, 25 grand, and so forth. Uh, opening balance equity is usually an entry in QuickBooks. Uh, that uh, means you didn't adjust that entry accordingly. So they might need to get on that. Clearly, this was not audited. And now this is as of December 31st, 2016. So we don't even know what happened more recently than that. But where's the income statement? Okay, so this is 2017. Pretty much the same story. Where is the income statement? Or we don't have one. Okay, profit and loss. All right, so for all of this promise and technology and, and all these crazy doodads, we've got $12,000 in income in 2016. 2017, we have zero income. So, I mean, clearly, these are all startups. They're pre-revenue, some of them. I get that. And that's how small companies start out. But at the same time, I can't help but crucify these companies because they're asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars based on nothing. They did no work. I mean, some of these companies are just a bank account that's been opened, you know? 
Um, so uh, look, look, you know, 2017, 500 bucks in the bank account. I mean, what are they going to do with this money? I mean, don't you need massive research and development to make these machines? I mean, these numbers are tiny. They're going to need at least a few hundred thousand dollars to get even a prototype going. So trying to understand what they're going to accomplish with these measly amounts of money, $88,000. I have no idea. I mean, I just don't see it going anywhere. And you're not even buying a, a, a stake in equity or, or debt. This is a membership interest, which maybe I'll, I'll look further into in a future video. But this just looks like a easy way to burn money. And in summary, I honestly don't see how any of these opportunities can lead to positive returns. I mean, we've looked at all four that are available here. And, you know, see how, see me, Robin, Autopilot, and Tended Bar. I mean, a lot of these seem like atrocious ways to spend money. But, but hey, you know, could one of these be the next Apple? Maybe. There's nothing really preventing that from happening. I just, you know... Uh, this tended bar situation, I have no idea how they're going to actually make this product given their numbers and what they're looking to raise here. Uh, Robin Autopilot, I mean, they're, they're having trouble even raising the amount they were looking for. But to have, pay these, this guy to deliver a Roomba for your front lawn, I don't know. How defendable is that? How much of a moat do they have? I mean, any other company with some money can put a robot together that senses when it's on the grass uh, and, and I don't know which one of these geniuses put his hand in the lawnmower, but I certainly wouldn't be giving him my money. Now, C.me, that's a disaster. I don't even want to talk about it. Now, Z House, they're using a buzzword that has been used and overused in the investment business. Uh, and so far, all of the blockchain buzzword companies that are public have had disastrous results. So... I can't see how this would be a great way to move forward in investing. But overall, I'm not trying to steer you in one direction or another. I'm just trying to make the case for due diligence. All these companies had amazing bullet points, had a great presentation. If you look in their investor deck, there's going to be an amazing assortment of bars, bar graphs and charts and all this other stuff that will excite your eyeballs. But at the end of the day, look at the actual financial statements because they're going to tell you a much different story. Now, a lot of these companies, if, if they have revenue and they're building the revenue over time and they're still losing money on that basis, I can understand that. When you're starting out, it's tough and they could be up against some big competitors. But when you don't even have an income line item on your financial statements, don't come on here and raise hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars and have people expect people to take you seriously. I mean, I just can't see that. And to me, it seems so insane, this world. This is why I'm so captivated by uh, equity crowdfunding. This is why I wanted to make this video. It's that I just don't understand how people go from holding real money to giving it to these people and expecting a positive return. I don't see it. Maybe I'm missing something. If I am, drop me a line in the comments below. Let me know what I'm missing in all these companies. And hey, maybe you, you'll change my mind. But for now, I don't see that any of these are, are viable. And more importantly, you got to do due diligence. All right. So the lesson that you should walk away with is that no matter how good the bullet points look, how nice the bar charts are, and how many graphs there are that make this company look phenomenal, you have to look at the financials to really get an idea of what's going on. And the numbers, for the most part, don't lie. Uh, sometimes they do, but typically they'll tell you the real story and it's hard to hide nonsense in the financial statements behind this sort of fanciness in the nice glossy videos and, and all, all sorts of uh, impressive bullet points. Because as we saw, impressive bullet points don't correlate to amazing financial results and that was directly out of the financial statements. So that's the important lesson here. Do your due diligence, dig down into the numbers, get the form C for these investments if you are considering making an investment in equity crowdfunding. Now, just to be clear, I understand startups. I understand the American dream. I understand it's tough to build a company from nothing. And I'm not attacking any of those things. What I'm saying is that if you ask for hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you ask for millions of dollars from people you've never met, 
you should have some traction, you should have some business built up, and you should have some revenue or even a, a profitable business model, why not, before you start franchising your company. And that's why I have a problem with some of these uh, crowdfunded equity situations is that they have made no effort to create a solid business. They've made no effort to make a sustainable business, but now they want your money to burn to try and go ahead and do that. That's where I have a problem. Now, if you have experience with this area and you've made investments in crowdfunding, let me know how they turned out in the comments below. I'm curious to hear about it. And hey, maybe you'll change my mind as to this whole business altogether. But I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching.